Hey guys, welcome back to Pop Up Chem. In this video, we're going to be carrying on with the structure determination component of unit 11 and 21 with infrared spectroscopy. We're going to look at how it works and how we can interpret the spectra. So, quick question for you based on the index of hydrogen deficiency based on last lesson. Give the video a pause and have a go at that. So remember, if we don't know the structure of the molecule, we can just use our IHD formula, 0.5 times 2x plus 2 minus y, where x is carbons and y is hydrogens. In this case, we also have a nitrogen, which remember adds one to both the carbon and the hydrogens. So we just plug in our values to our equation, which gives us an overall value of five. So a quick reminder, infrared radiation is part of the electromagnetic spectrum and it is just below visible light in terms of its energy and has a slightly longer wavelength. Now, what's special about infrared radiation is it causes vibrational changes in chemical bonds. Infrared spectroscopy utilizes what we know about these changes to help us identify what bonds are present in a molecule. So we can visualize this through a kind of schematic. We have an infrared source and a couple of mirrors that fire that source through two chambers. One of those is the sample and one of those is the reference. The reference is usually the solvent that we've dissolved the sample in. And then the signals are brought to a splitter and detector and then that information can be processed. The key here is we can compare the spectra of the reference, the solvent or the plate material, and the difference between the transmission of different wavelengths of infrared light between the sample and the reference tells us that if there is a particular frequency missing, then we assume that that has been absorbed by the bonds in our sample. The energy absorbed by the bonds in the molecule causes vibrations. And because each of these vibrations are different in each bond, they give a characteristic vibration. They come in two main types. These are bending and stretching. The bending type is where the molecules bonds oscillate on an angle. We can have asymmetrical where they bend in opposite directions or we can have symmetrical where they kind of bounce forward and backwards together. We can also have stretching in which the bonds elongate and compress. Again, this can come in an asymmetrical form or the bonds in the molecule can symmetrically elongate and compress. There are three factors that affect this, the bond strength, the bond length, and the mass of the atoms at the end of the bonds. Just from these three factors alone, we know that every single bond is going to have a slightly different signature in an infrared spectrum. So this is what a spectrum looks like. You'll see you have transmittance on the y-axis. And so the lower the transmittance, that means we have a high absorbance. And on the bottom, we have wave number, which is one over the wavelength. Why do we have wave number? Well, it's a little bit like pH. Quite simply, it's easier to read and it's easier to compute. So before we do anything more on characteristic peaks, let's do a couple of quick questions. First question then, what property of all bonds makes IR so useful in analysis? Pause the video to give yourself a moment for that. Pop them up! It is of course the vibration that it causes in the molecules remember, are bending and stretching. And all of those have their own specific frequency and wavelength. 
Okay, next, what three factors affect the wave number of absorption? Pause the video to give yourself a moment. Pop them up! It is, of course, bond strength, bond length, and the relative atomic mass of the atoms at either end of the bonds. So in infrared spectroscopy, how does detection inform us of the changes in the molecule? Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. Well, of course, we know that any wavelength of infrared radiation not detected is absorbed by the bonds in the molecule. When it comes to using infrared spectroscopy, for identifying molecules, no two organic molecules have the same spectra. And we have two main places we can focus our energy. Functional groups give the same repeated absorption when they're observed in a molecule. These are called identification peaks. And you can use table 26 of your data booklet as a list of peaks that give expected absorptions. These are between 1500 and 4000 nanometers to the left hand side of any in infrared spectra that you may come across. However, there is also what we call the fingerprint region, which is the region up to about 1500 from 500 at the very right of the spectra. And this is much more complicated and is usually compared to an online database of other spectra to allow us to more accurately identify the compound because of how hard that region is to interpret. So here we have a typical example of a spectra and I've also included table 26 from the data book although you may want to have that data book also open alongside. So we're not going to occupy ourselves with the fingerprint region kind of below 1500. We're going to focus on what we can see beyond that. So the first thing we see is a strong peak just beyond 1700 between 17 and 1750. And if we look at table 26, then a strong peak in that area indicates a C double bond O that could be part of an aldehyde, ketone or carboxylic acid. It's not necessarily clear which one, but we do know that that is present. With the smaller peaks on the left hand side, it's harder to tell. And that is because of the signal to noise ratio. So we tend to focus on these strong absorbances given by large peaks as we can be more sure about their presence. This molecule incidentally was actually propanone, which unsurprisingly has that C double bond O. However, these spectra may even give us more information. So here we've got the empirical formula C3H8O and in general, I'm gonna steer clear of our fingerprint region again and instead focus on the peaks that we see over here. So we have a peak just below 3000, very strong, narrow peak. And when we look over at our table, we see that is to do with a CH bond from alkenes and the like. And then we have this large broad peak around 3350. And we see that if we see this strong broad peak, it's to do with OH. But a specific type of OH from alcohols, not that found in carboxylic acids that has a separate absorption. Indeed, just from the empirical formula and these two peaks, we know that we must have propen-1-ol or propen-2-ol. Okay, grab your data booklet and try and interpret this one. Slightly fiendish as two of the peaks in this one overlap but can you still identify them? Remember, you don't need to pay attention to the fingerprint region. Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. So remember, we're not gonna try and interpret the fingerprint region. And I see one very strong peak here, just past 1700. That's gonna be a carbonyl C double bond O. 
And so if we trace out this larger peak, almost imagining where it could be, this fits with our OH group from a carboxylic acid group because it's a peak right around 3000. We can also see inside that peak, there is a strong absorbance around 2900 area, which we would associate with a CH bond. So once we've done that interpretation and we're given the molecular formula, we're able to kind of hypothesize what this molecule might be. So we've identified a C double bond O, an OH group from a carboxylic acid. So we know there must be a carboxylic acid group in there. And we know there's some CH bonds. And from the molecular formula, we know there must be three more carbons. So it's probably likely that this is butanoic acid. It may also be in the form of the second carbon in the chain being tertiary with two CH3 groups. But we would use further techniques to be able to more accurately differentiate between those two molecules. At this point, there's nothing better than getting used to looking at these spectra and trying to interpret them. So there are some questions for you to be getting on with. Thanks again for joining me. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and as always, practice makes slightly better. <laughs>